Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Coronado PST, that's a personal solar telescope. So you know, the solar telescope reviews on this channel are not the most watched reviews here, but the people who do watch them tend to be very passionate. They'll write me long letters about their experiences, they'll get into discussions and debates in the comments below. So it's still a bit of a niche in our hobby, but the people in it are quite passionate about what they do. So the customary word up front, please do not look at the sun unless you are sure you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, you have a tendency to know that you know what you're doing. If there is any doubt in your mind, please do not look at the sun for any reason. Permanent eye damage, including blindness, can occur. Having said that, looking at the sun can be a very pleasant experience on its own and can be a sub-hobby within the larger hobby of amateur astronomy. So if you do want to look at the sun, there's a couple of ways you can do this. The less expensive way is to get one of these. It's a white light filter. This one is built for my Takahashi FC100, and it just slips on the front of the scope. And what this does is it brings down all of the wavelengths of light by about the same amount. So this is referred to as a broadband filter. The problem with the broadband filter is after a few minutes, it's kind of interesting to look at the sunspots. You know, it's okay, but then you kind of get bored. Still, I think if you have a telescope, these are under $100, they're cheap, and it's something that's nice to have. You can do it for star parties, and you know, something that you can just have in your arsenal for if you feel like looking at the sun once in a while. But if you want to make the leap, you really do need this. It's an H-alpha telescope, and unlike the broadband filter, this is a narrow band filter. The idea being you're only looking at the wavelengths of light that you need to see, and the problem with a broadband filter is all of the other wavelengths of light sort of muddy up the image. So the narrower the broadband, the better. So I started off on this channel with that Lunt 100 Universal Solar Telescope that was convertible to an astronomical telescope, and much of the mail I got said the same thing. That's really great. Does it have to cost $8,000? Well, that one does, but... I followed up with a Coronado 60 millimeter review. That one is somewhat more reasonable at $3,500, but people still said, yeah, you know, it's a lot of money to look at one object. What's the cheapest way I can get into H-alpha observing? Well, right now it's this model. It's the PST, Personal Solar Telescope. It's a 40 millimeter aperture here. Pretty small, but uh, this model has been in the lineup and in our hobby for quite some time. It is the closest thing to an iconic vintage telescope within the solar telescope world. Way back when, it listed for $495. These days, of course, telescopes have gone up in price. This one is now up to $895 at the time of filming. Kind of makes you want to get into a time machine and go back and buy a bunch of these, doesn't it? So this was not the only game in town. There have been some variants. There was a 40 millimeter variant that was styled and built like one of Coronado's other solar telescopes. It was another 40 millimeter. It had better optics and it was just an all around better telescope, but it cost quite a bit. Even back in the day, it was somewhere around $1,500 or so. More recently, there has been a double stacked version of this 40 millimeter telescope, again, Price goes up quite a bit to around $1,500 or $1,600 US at the time of filming. For me, 40 millimeters doesn't gather a lot of light. When you put the stacking etalon in here, it dims the image even more. Putting two etalons, double stacking it, brings the brightness down even more. To me, double stacking something this small, the image starts getting really dim. I don't care for it. I know some of you have those things out there and you do use them. To me, it's just too dim. So let's take a closer look at this telescope, and at the end of this review, I'll tell you if I think you should buy one of these. You know, every time I see one of these things, I'm impressed by the nice industrial design here. As this is a product designed for beginners, I think they've made it to the point where it's really hard to misuse the product or get yourself hurt. This is in contrast to some of the larger models where you could, you know, take something out and potentially create an unsafe condition. This is a self-contained unit and really nicely done. So that you've got a 40 millimeter aperture here. That is pretty small. If you think about it, your 50 millimeter finder gathers something like 50% more light than this thing does. So the light gathering ability is probably the Achilles heel of this product. We have this on a Vixen-compatible dovetail plate. There are many ways to do this. 
Now they used to make a tabletop mount called a Malta and that appears to be discontinued now and if you want one of those I think it's going to be tough because if you find that mount it's probably going to be attached to the scope itself and you're probably going to have to buy the whole thing all, all as one package. But again it's pretty simple here the uh, 18 millimeter eyepiece has gone missing here no big loss you can replace that if you want to the uh, exit pupil is really tiny here <laughs> don't worry about that it works just fine there is no traditional finder there is this window here and it's a right angle type thing so that's good also for beginners because they were, you're not going to be tempted to look through a finder at the sun you just look down on this and with a 40 millimeter f10 the focal length of this thing is only about 400 millimeters it's pretty easy to find the sun and you'll see a little white dot there show up when you get close to the sun and you center it and the image will be in the eyepiece so there's only two controls here and again they've kept this pretty simple and even though they aren't labeled I think that even a beginner can figure this out pretty quickly. So this black knob here that turns this is the Edelon this is the tuning filter and the reason that's there is because the correct tuning for surface detail on the sun is not quite the same as the tuning for the prominences that's the stuff at the edges so you wind up sort of tuning this back and forth to see one or the other this chrome knob here is the focus there is an internal focuser some people have expressed some concerns that this is not user repairable but I've never seen one of these things break so I'm not concerned about that the optical tube is so light even with the eyepiece and plate installed only around three and a half pounds you could make a case that you could put this on a conventional photographic tripod. Now you can do that as a stopgap, but I think I'd eventually still want to see you put this on a dedicated astronomy specific mount. It's just going to be more sturdy and be able to track the sky a little bit better. If you do put it on an equatorial mount like this one with electronic go to capability, do remember to set it to solar mode. Remember, the sun moves at a slightly different rate. So when you first start doing this, your first challenge is going to be finding the sun. I know that sounds silly. The sun is the brightest object in the sky, but the first couple of times you do this, trust me, you're gonna have a little bit of difficulty finding the sun. The normal way to do this is to stand with your back to the sun and then minimize the shadow of the telescope on the ground. Then you can use the finder to center the object. Now, some people have asked, how does the finder get its light? Is it stealing light from the main aperture of the telescope? No, it does not. If you look very carefully, there is a tiny pinhole at the bottom of the scope here. A little bit hard to see, but that's where it gets its light. Now, once you get the sun in the eyepiece, you're gonna to wanna to do this. Get or make a glare shield. Now, I know some of you go to great lengths to make complicated versions of this, but I just have a piece of cardboard that I cut a hole in, and you just slip it over the front of the scope like this. This keeps the sun from getting in your eyes. You are going to want to do this. Okay, so the sun's coming up over there. Looks like it's gonna be a nice morning. After I get done talking to you here, I'm gonna sit down and observe the sun for a while. Now, if you want to, you can use this telescope for some basic solar imaging. The emphasis is on basic. This thing isn't all that great. I had trouble coaxing good images out of this thing. This is described as an acromat, and if that's true, acromats have a tendency to not do terribly well with the webcam lunar planetary imagers because they're not as well corrected outside the visible spectrum, but the camera can see it and it has a tendency to muddy up the image. But I have one of these and you can put one of these in there and take a video capture and run it through Registax or AutoStackard and you can get an image like this. This is okay, it's not great. If it's your first time doing this, if you've never done any solar imaging before, that might look pretty good. But just a few months earlier, I had taken this image with the 60 millimeter double stacked Coronado and I was able to get that. And this is done with a lot less effort than the one with the 40. Now, this isn't a fair comparison. That 60 millimeter Coronado was double stacked. It had better optics and it had more aperture and it also cost over $3,000, but you get the idea. Okay, are there any disadvantages to this model? Yes, the big one is the aperture. With only 40 millimeters of light gathering ability, you run out of light pretty fast. With the 
low power eyepiece in there at 18 to 20 power or so, it was fine, but put any magnification on it and the image starts to get pretty dim and the images start to break down quite a bit. Keep in mind, the maximum useful magnification for any 40 millimeter telescope is not gonna be that high. So confine yourself to low power viewing and you should be fine. Okay, do I think you should buy one of these? Overall, the answer is, Yes, I think you should. I think that anybody who is interested in amateur astronomy should at some point either own a dedicated H-alpha solar telescope or have ready access to one nearby. A couple of caveats to this. Number one, buy used if you can. There are plenty of these out on the market. This model's been around for a long time. If you're not finding what you want at the price that you want to pay, stick around, something will come along. These are very safe buys as used items. Usually the person selling it is doing so because they're just raising some funds to buy a larger model. Second caveat, do I think this is a permanent long-term solution to your H-alpha solar telescope needs? No, I do not. The aperture is just too small. I think what will happen is when you first get this thing, you're gonna be thrilled with it, but hang around the hobby and for any length of time and you'll eventually meet somebody who has a 60 millimeter, an 80 millimeter or larger H-alpha solar telescope and you'll see what you've been missing. So do keep that in mind. So there you have it, a look at the Coronado Mead PST Personal Solar Telescope. I hope this video has given you some information to determine if this telescope is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.